Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. I wanted to um, go over a couple of things in terms of what we've been covering in this class in Live and Learn uh, over, we, we got up to all the way into Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam and extended into the life of Ishaq and Ismail alayhi salam. And subhanAllah, I want to take some time, uh, inshallah, last week because of it was the week of Eid, that may every year of yours be blessed. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant you husn khatima into, as we finish this blessed month of Dhul Hijjah and into, inshallah, the month of Muharram. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless for us the, the month of Muharram. As, but before we get into, uh, you know, and before we continue in our series, as we're closing out, as we are uh, closing out this year, I want us to actually reconnect for what are some of the reasons and the purposes for which is it important for us to study any of the Anbiya, the lives, the Qisas and Anbiya, the stories and the lives of uh, the prophets of Allah. First, understanding, you know, the uh, understanding, of course, that these are those who connect the creation to the creator, the create, the creation to the creator, right? That these are the ones who literally give us the breadcrumbs by which we're able to follow this path back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala giving each and every one of us details about the life, sorry, of each and every one of the prophets, what we're able to do is to be able to see uh, again, there, there are stories that happen inside of their life that are a means of guidance, that are a means of uh, insight into our own condition, into our own condition individually, and into our own condition uh, as a people. For example, when I say into our own condition individually, of course, all of us are familiar that anytime we experience sickness or hardship or uh, things that we have to be patient about, there's always opportunity for us to draw upon the life of Prophet Ayyub alayhi salam, who, the one who was sick, all right, for over 18 years, the one who endured such hardship as the loss of his family, the loss of his children, and then the level of patience and, and perseverance that he has in terms of his internal perseverance, in terms of holding on to his faith. And of course, the du'a and the akkar, the dhikr that he's making during this time. And so there are things that we draw upon in our own life to be able to say, you know, subhanAllah, this is an example for me of, of sabr. Then, of course, there are other cases where we might suffer family hardship. There might be things that we might endure from other family members. And we may look to the case of Adam, alayhi salam, wa qabil wa habir. There are Cases, of course, that we look to, uh, and of course, tons of lessons that we draw upon from the from the life of Prophet Yusuf, alayhi salam, who, inshallah, we're coming uh, to study, the idnilah, we're coming to review. He will be our next prophet that we would, actually, Yaqub, and then Yusuf, alayhi salam, that we would go through their lifestyle. And so in understanding that these specific uh, lessons or gems as it relates to character, as it relates to akhlaq, as it relates to how we should behave or interact inside of this dunya in order to return back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in, in a pure state, right? With qalban saliman, with a sound heart. But there's something that's greater, even beyond the heart matter. And I don't want us as Muslims to be, for it to be lost on us. And that has to do with some, some, some real key understanding and acceptance and submission as it relates to matters of creed, as it relates to literally creed or uh, in, in uh, the Arabic in this case is aqidah. And aqidah, as, as we're familiar with, is that aqidah is the science that governs the mind. The, the science that governs what is it that the believer must wrap their mind around? What is it that, that the believer must believe? 
What is it that the believer must come into the understanding of? And even if one does not come into the understanding of it, where is the ultimate submission to say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right, who is al Khaliq, who is the one who is the absolute and only creator of the heavens and the earth and everything in between, then actually has the absolute uh, right to govern his creation. And are there things that are inside the lives of the Anbiya that we're actually willing to be, uh, you know, there's a, there's, a, there's something called, you know, sometimes, uh, it said, I don't necessarily want to obey. I don't necessarily want to be in submission. So that is an ibadah in and of itself. That is an internal, um, that is an internal adjustment, even in and unto itself to say, I want to obey. I want to submit. I want to be amongst those who are found uh, in submission to Allah Azza wa Jal mentally, physically, and spiritually, because that's a higher reality than just being in submission. To say that I don't, I, I want, I'm searching the books, I'm searching out uh, the, the way of the NBI, I'm searching out their lives, their behavior, their lessons, the, 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 the gems that I meant to learn from them so that I can put myself in order, right? So that I know exactly what should, what should be my thinking. And this is, this is actually uh, something quite of, of a big deal because in many times, especially as it relates to the, the Westerner, right, is that we're willing, as, as Muslims, we're willing to change our names. We're willing to change our dress. We're willing to change our address, meaning where we live, to live in one country or to live in another country. We're willing to change the food that we eat, right? I could go from eating soul food, you know, things that I'm used to eating inside of, of you know, where I'm from, uh, people who are in Jacksonville, Florida, that migrated from the Gullah Islands and inside, you know, and, and South Carolina and, and, and Georgia. I'm willing to change that even to eat biryani and Arab kebab. And I'm willing to change the food that I eat. Right. I'm even willing to change, uh, you know, I'm even willing to change some aspects of my personality and some aspects of my character. But most of us are not willing to change the way we think. And this is this is the key. Uh, this is the key to the door and understanding why the study of Apida is absolutely a far science. It's an obligatory science because we're willing to study and adjust and to uh, to interact with a number of philosophies inside of academia. We're willing to. Uh, we're willing to even Muhammad. What I want to um, the word I want to use is that we're willing uh, to wrestle with certain philosophies or ideas or theories and even accept them knowing full well that they're theories. Right? We're willing to look at certain philosophical ideas and put our um and even in, in, inside of our studies, say, I've got to put my, uh, an idea, an original thought or idea in it. And that's, you know, that's the struggle, right? To know whether or not my idea is an original idea, whether or not I'm thinking independently, whether or not I'm thinking critically enough that we have been trained to take what we would consider for the most part, right? True enough that we're willing to consider or to take what we would consider our original idea or a concern that we have and put it inside of someone else's academic framework. But in studying the Qisas al Anbiya, the question becomes, are we willing 
to place our thinking inside of Allah Azawajal's framework? Is it something that we're saying that, that these are, uh, these are, and, and subhanAllah, al din and Islam and wasi'ah, right? The way of Allah Azawajal, the path of Sarat al Mustaqim is a wide and broad and beautiful path. And Uqsum Billah, there is more to it, right? Then even we would spend a lifetime, uh, you know, studying. Yet there are certain boundaries that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us to stay within the framework of these boundaries. The same as you know, in order for I'm trying to uh, I have all kinds of um, farming ideas in my mind, and yet I'm not a farmer, so you have to be patient with me. That you know, I remember uh, when you want to grow a certain when you want to grow a certain amount of fruit that will yield increase. Not just generally you just plant one seed, but when you want it to increase, there's certain things that you need to do in order to place around those trees in order for it to stand upright. There must be a garden around that fence that keep the animals from attacking and actually stealing the fruit of it. In order so that that particular garden has the ability, uh, has the ability to give increase, has the ability to be something that is beneficial and nourishment and, and for, for many and more beyond just the average, right? Beyond the average tree, it grows, the fruit falls, animals come and take it. There's nothing, there is no, there's no boundaries to it. So it can give. It can give, as is the nature of the earth. The mind can think, as is the nature of the mind. The mind can reason, as is the nature of the mind. But without the fits, without the, the boundaries of aqidah, without the understanding, it doesn't give the correct or the amount of increase that leads to the increase of the garden of Jannah. And so in understanding, even as we approach the lives of the Anbiya, the lives of the Prophet, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give peace and blessings upon all of them. There must be a very clear understanding about who they are and who they're not and who they're meant to be and who they're not meant to be. And what is specifically your relationship to them? And what does this have to do with your life? So in looking at some of the conditions, first and foremost, of prophecy, right? There are some conditions, some things that uh, subhanAllah bihamdi, subhanAllah al-adim, there are some things that uh, in the conditions of prophecy, we, we will review. The first thing is that they must be human, right? And this I'm being specific as it relates to Anbiya in this case. And I don't want us to be confused with different types of emissaries or different types of messengers. For example, we know that angel Jibra'il alayhi salam, he comes, right? He comes with the message. He comes to deliver, his responsibility is to come and deliver the message. 
But one of the jobs of a prophet, right, is that a prophet is more than just someone who's hot. Someone who is, there are two types of knowledge. One who is just a mere carrier of knowledge, meaning they took it, right? They preserved it and they spit it out exactly as it is. They heard it, they memorized it, they repeated it exactly as it is. And then there's another type and there is and, and there is benefit, of course, as we know, there is great benefit to the hafid, right? To the hufat, those who preserve. And then there's another type of knowledge of those who process, right? Those who hear it, understand it, process it. How does it apply? How is it going to be, how is it going to be delivered? How is it going to uplift the people? How is it going to solve problems? How is it going to provide solutions? How is it going to heal hearts? How is it going to address the people? How is it going to uplift? How is it going to guide? How it, should it be delivered? When should it be delivered, right? The ones who are the processors then come and produce a new knowledge. So for example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, la nufarruqu baynahum. Right? In, in the last ayat of Surah Al-Baqarah, that there was no difference in talking about the Anbiya and talking about the prophets of Allah, saying that there was no difference between them. So if there's no difference between them, how is it that they come in ranks? How is it that there are five amongst them Right, as we mentioned, Ibrahim alayhi salam, and some of our scholars mentioned Nuh from amongst them. Right, we know that Isa alayhi salam, Mu, sorry, Musa alayhi salam. Let me do them in order. Right, so Ibrahim, Nuh, um, Muhammad Daoud with the Zabur, sorry, Daoud with the Zabur. Isa with the Injil, and of course the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, right, with the Quran. So Musa, so Ibrahim wa Musa, right? So Ibrahim has a suhu for the scrolls, right? Musa, of course, comes with the Injil, and there are some of our scholars who mention that Prophet Noah alayhi salam was amongst these chief ones, uh, in in terms of what he brought, and and um that he has his own text. More upon that later. But the point is, is that they are chief. They are considered in a higher maqam than some of the other anbiya and some of the other prophets. Why is that? Because the method by which that they were they delivered the clear message is not the same. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is teaching tawheed regardless. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is teaching la ilaha illallah. Regardless, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is teaching humanity how to be truly human regardless. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is laying out the path back to the garden of Jannah regardless. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving us the qualities and the characteristics of, of what it means for the human being to be loved by Allah regardless. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is teaching us the tenets of our deen regardless. He's teaching us how to pray. He's teaching us how to fast, how to give charity, how to serve humanity. That is going to be across the board. But the methodology and the method is the, is the reason why there are some prophets who come on Yom Qiyamah with no followers. And there are some who come with one follower. Some come with five. Some come with ten. Come, some come with hundreds. Some with thousands, some tens of thousands. The Prophet Muhammad will come with a, a horizon. His ummah will fill the horizon. Right? Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Habibina Munan Muhammad bin Wala Ali Usabi Wasanna. And so him coming with the, you know, this amount speaks to his methodology for which how he delivers the message. 
which decides their ranking. Which, you know, this is important for us. There are lessons to be derived from that as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us permission to give da'wah for how we deliver it, right? Of course, with emotional intelligence, how we deliver the message to the people, whether it's with firmness or harshness or whether it's gentle, whether it's loving, whether it's, does it understand the uraf of the people, the context of the people? So the first context is that they're human. They come in human form so that the human being would have no case against Allah and say, Ya Allah, right? You made them, right? You made them angels. You created them, right? I completely to worship you. They're always in this state, right? That I, you know, Allah, subhanAllah, of course, we cannot be angels. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made prophets from the human beings, from humankind. Now, one of you know, they must not be handicapped. They're free from defect. And the type of defect, I want to be very specific, the type of defect that would cause people to flee from them. The type of defect that would cause that if they had some kind of sickness or disease that would prevent them from being able to deliver the message. This is the point inside of this, right? So number one, they're human. Number two, they're free of handicap or a disease that would cause them to, that would prevent them from being able to deliver the message. The next, that they are free, right? Meaning so that when they are free, that they have the ability to travel through the earth and deliver the message, which is why subhanAllah, that prophecy has 80 stations. And prophecy having 80 stations, having this maqamat is uh, something that is, it's, it's building. Right? It doesn't come all in one. Even the Prophet وسلم, as there are moments where he's coming closer, right? There, his dreams increase, the 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 he begins to hear the sounds of angels, right? He begins to hear the trees and the rocks even saying salam, right? But it's not until that fateful day that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, This is the day that the angel Jibra'il, this is the day that your heart is actually ready to receive. Right, the message to, to receive Jibra'il. Now you've reached this maqam. Even though Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created them to be prophets, prophecy is not something that you could, uh, it's not something that you could study your way up to, you know, say if once I graduate. And this is a, a very key difference in Islam between Islam and all and, and other ways, other understandings, other religious understanding of the concept of prophecy. That in Islam, prophecy is not something that can be, you know, uh, studied upon. It's not something that you could pray your way upon, that you could worship your way upon to become prophet. And that doesn't mean that's that's a that's again a station. It doesn't mean that you wouldn't experience some of the experiences that are connected to prophecy, like ilham like being inspired by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, like having communication with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has demonstrated for us in the Quran multiple times amongst those who are guided by Allah. But those who have the responsibility to carry the risala specifically of prophecy is, is, a, is a different category. It's why, for example, the Muslims can say that we love Isa alayhi salam he is considered the Messiah. He is considered to be amongst, he is considered in a very high station. He's considered a virgin birth. He's considered, uh, you know, he, he, he is the Christ. He is the Messiah. He is a virgin birth. He, he walked on water. He raised the dead. He committed, a, there are a number of miracles, right? That, that Isa alayhi salam has, and he is infallible and he is perfect. But they say, but he's not divine. He is not God for the Muslim. You say, well, how is that possible? How can he raise the dead? How can he have these many miracles? How could he, you know, how could he do all of these things and not be divine? The difference is because to be a perfect man is different than being a perfect illa. A perfect man and God are not the same. They're not on the same level. 
they have high rank. So for, for the Muslim to say that Prophet Isa, that Isa, that Jesus is a prophet, right? Is, does not put him on, on, the, on a layman average. It doesn't make him just a preacher. It doesn't mean that, you know, he just received inspiration. No, it means something much higher than that. Something much greater than that. But does it touch the level of divine? No. That which is worthy of worship, that which is absolutely all powerful, that which is absolutely uh, all knowing, that which is the source of life, that which is the al khalik the creator, can, is not the created. No. These are two separate realities. Because the one who is the creator cannot be created. That's not. These are two separate realities. But yet, to have a to be prophet is not the same as preacher or da'i or ustad or sheikh or layman, not at all. These are not the same level. These are not the same level. And so these are things that we have to understand. Now, in let's say in the majority, and there's some debate about this, I won't go into too much detail, but the majority in the relied upon position is that the NBA are also male. Now, at this point, people start to go, oh my God, you're like, oh. I'm like, why is it that all prophets are male? How come they can't be female? Hold tight, slow down. There are a number of things, beautiful lessons inside of this. The first thing is, I want to say there are only 124,000 prophets. 124,000 prophets. Whose responsibility is to carry the souls of their own. Now, interestingly enough, for the only 124,000 that are responsible for carrying the souls of their ummah, a woman knows what it is to carry multiple souls inside of her own body. A woman knows, right? A woman, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the Prophet وسلم, tells us in Hadith al Qudsi, Arrahim al Mu'alakat al Arsh, right? The womb is connected to the throne of Allah. That this divine decree, the, the divine command of Allah, that which is a matter of the unseen, as Allah describes in Surah Nisa about the woman, that she's the guardian of the unseen. And that would be a class we could have for months. A month we could be talking about the meaning of just this, this term, but one of the, un, one of the aspects of it is that she is the protector of Allah's divine decree. That when that child or that human being or that message, hear what I said, the child, the human being, or the message comes into the earth. That which is going to be the means by which provisions the next philosopher, the next uh, Fortune 500 CEO, the next doctor who will cure cancer or a common cold, the next one who will deliver the coronavirus vaccine or whatever, all of that divine decree, every single aspect Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is sending through, right? Even who's going to be the next farmer who's going to put your corn inside, you know, going to pluck your corn and put it on the truck and deliver it to, to your whole food so it can be in your home. Even that is a matter of Allah's divine decree that all comes through the womb of the woman into this on the earth. So Allah's divine decree coming through the womb of a woman, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is carrying out his command, the daily command, right, through women. So let there be, if, 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 if anyone were to say, is this an unfair matter, then it would be unfair on the other side that there are only 100, there, every single woman has a womb that's connected to the throne of Allah, but there are only 124,000 of the anbiya. In addition to, it doesn't mean that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't have communication with these women, as is described in the case of Ummi Musa, right? In the Quran that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, is giving, he's revealing about a conversation that he has between him and the mother of Musa when Allah says, I told her to do, to do this, right? And she turns back and said, my heart is fatted. 
right? And then she, Allah then orders her to do this. And then she responds. This is a conversation between Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the mother of Musa. And every prophet, every single prophet comes into this world through the, through the womb of a woman. Nursed by a woman. Cared for by a woman. There are many, 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 subhanAllah, uh, aspects of this that are not even, uh, in terms of her uh, women receiving revelation, this is not even a question. This is not even a question. Allahumma salli ala habibina mawlana Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. But in understanding this job, and again, there's, there's a minority opinion that speaks to, because again, there are women who definitely uh, received revelation. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's relationship with Maryam, detailed in the Quran, detailed, detailed, and more, and more. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as I mentioned last week, uh, or two weeks ago, builds our entire, the holiest city and our deen around Hajar. So it's important that we don't uh, misunderstand or mis mistake our deen for uh, it's, it's important that we understand and that we at least have what are the conditions of prophecy first and foremost then beyond the condition there are uh, there are things that they come with they come with sid with futana wa amana they come with truthfulness and trustworthiness. They never lie. They're ma'asum. They're ma'asum. They're infallible. They don't lie. They don't cheat. They don't steal. This is another line in the sand between Islam and other ways. That for us, that the ones that Allah entrusts with risala, the ones that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala entrusts with revelation, they don't commit sin in this way not the sin of the average. Are there errors of etiquette? That's another matter. The prophet frowning, right? Even when the blind man cannot see his frown, this is a whole nother matter. This speaks to his maqam. This is not a sin against Sharia. They're always truthful in their speech, trustworthy in their behavior. They uphold the highest of amana. And they are sagacious, meaning they are. there isn't a question they couldn't answer their wisdom is high and wide. There isn't something that someone would stump them with something that they couldn't answer. In understanding. Oh. The lives of the prophets and particularly our aqidah around it. As we begin to detail their life, it becomes a matter, and it always becomes a challenge of submission, of acceptance, of belief, of elevation, of opportunity to be steadfast, of what it means to be firm upon Surat al Mustaqim. And the moment that we, it's, it's okay, Alhamdulillah, wa shukurillah. Alhamdulillah wa shukrillah, it's okay to have questions. It's okay, it's okay to be able to say, I have a question about this. Even, uh, even the chief, Ibrahim alayhi salam, right? He has questions, ya Allah. He asks about the sun, the stars, the moon, and he comes to the conclusion. I don't like things that said. He uses an intellectual judgment. He has others. They, he comes back to Allah, Allah. How do you rise? How do you raise the, the, the dead back to life? Allah says, Do you doubt? No, Ya Rabbi, I don't doubt. I'm sure about it. But just to make me firm, I just want to know how you do it. He's asking the question. Allah demonstrates for him and for us. Right? Musa alayhi salam says, Ya Allah, can I see you? There are, it's not a matter. I want us to understand that the term submission is something that some, when the term submission is thrown out, sometimes we become like, ooh, ooh. 
we become like, you know, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala recognize in us. May Allah manifest in us. When we are the ones who are those who submit and when it is time to be those who resist. Because there's a timing for both. And in studying the lives of the Anbiya, the lives of the prophets, let us renew our intention, bi idnillah, as it is our intention to continue with this next week, to go over the details with the kind of heart that says, marhaban, whatever it is, ya Rabbi, that you place in front of me to, to, to learn, bless me to be found in, in obedience to it, in submission to it, in understanding. Grant me understanding. But I want us to understand that there is a, there's a, a thing that says, before submission, I understand. I think many of us have seen this. When in reality, only when it comes to the matter of Allah, when it comes to the matter of Allah, First I submit, and then he grants me understanding. It's different. First I submit, and then he grants me understanding. I give him my mind, he expands it for me. I give him my heart, he expands it for me. I give him my soul, he expands it, he elevates it. He gives increase. I give him my heart, he illuminates it for me. If you're waiting for the understanding before the submission, then what you're saying is I worship my intellect more than I worship the more than I worship Allah as a Does it mean you put down your intellect? Absolutely not. Allah constantly calls, calls us to reason. But it's the timing of it. It's usually you start to do a thing. Then you understand how it works. Inshallah, I want to go to Q&A uh, in, uh, in discussing this topic uh, and from an aspect of Aqidah. Aqidah is something that, subhanAllah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends all of, you know, sends these sciences in order to be a means by which we connect to Allah, Azza by which we're able to become closer to Allah and have greater understanding. And so, you know, subhanAllah, teaching classes online is, is so challenging. It's not as easy as teaching classes uh, inside the classroom. Why? Because they say uh, when you're teaching, you know, when our teachers of old used to teach, especially small, even small matters of aqidah, they wait until everyone comes into the room. And when everyone comes into the room, they lock the door and sit on the key. And when they lock them, when they sit on the key, they say, I will not get up from this key until everyone understands. <laughs> right? that no one will leave inshallah except that they leave with an understanding of it because it's a matter of our faith it's a matter of us uh, becoming closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and so with that being said you know nothing should nothing should uh, just as we you know get concerned about coronavirus or the delta variant or you know all a thief or whatever it is there should be more concern over the loss of our deen. There should be a hundred thousand times more the concern over the deviation of our thought, of being outside of, of, of what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has decreed as our creed. What is it that I meant to believe? What is it I'm supposed to wrap my mind around? Because it definitely is going to change aspects of even our worldview, how we wrap our minds around Islamic concepts. It's how we develop our lives. It's how we build our understanding. It becomes, it becomes how we interact in the world. So with that being said, inshallah, if there are questions that people are having, please, 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 Raise your hand and let me know. 
Ask me a question. Bismillah. Or you can write a question in the chat. You guys are dead silent on me tonight. <laughs> No questions? Mm. So the first one, uh, the reason why we study, of course, so there, there's a, a famous saying that says, of course we study to know, but in reality, we study not just to know, we study to become, I, we study to be for who we're going to be. We study for the sake of becoming near and close to Allah. We study for the sake of saying, what is it that Allah wants me to understand? We study for the sake of expansion, for correction, for knowing where our consciousness should, should rise and fall. We study for the sake of, we, we also study for the sake of, of um, rectification of a certain consciousness that we already have. So to build, right, to build, to rectify, right, and to expand, ultimately, so that we can become. Any other questions? Mm. So there are types of knowledge. There are fodder knowledge, obligatory knowledge, right? Like for example, fodder knowledge, obligatory knowledge are the knowledges that are uh, for inside the Hadith of Jibra'il. Like, the uh, the prop the, uh, the in the hadith of Jibrail, the famous hadith where the Prophet is sitting in a gathering and a man appears whose hair is extremely dark, whose clothes are extremely white. He has no sign of travel. And he asked the Prophet three questions. And I'm giving the paraphrase here. He asked the Prophet uh, what is Islam, what is Iman, and what is Ihsan? What is Islam? So what is Islam? He gives him the five pillars. So of course it becomes mandatory to know when to understand, like these are the things that you must do. These are the sciences that govern the body, fiqh. So it becomes what, how must you, what are the conditions of the, of the shahada, the salah, the psalm, fasting, uh, the, the conditions of zakat, paying zakat, and of course, how do I make hajj? The next of course are the matters of what, the, uh, what do you believe? What is iman, to believe in Allah? Right, so it becomes mandatory. It's a far knowledge, obligatory to know the science, at least to know the basis of who is Allah, right? Who Allah is and who is not. Um, understanding who who is Allah, the angels, the prophets, the books, divine decree, and akhirah. So it becomes these are this is all encompassed inside of aqidah, what we must believe and understand. How do we, what is it that I must believe and know about Allah, about the angels, about his prophets, about his books? These are the things. And then uh, aspects of what is ihsan, which is a matter of taskiyah, which is the purification of the heart. And then, of course, how to beautify the soul. So these are the obligatory sciences. Other than there are sunnah sciences. Like, for example, if I want, I, I have to learn a certain level of tajweed, a certain level of Quran that's going to help me pray, worship my Lord. Right? And then there's some aspects of 
uh, some aspects that are not necessarily farmed. I don't have to, it's not obligatory upon me, for example, to know all of the tafsir of Surah Taha. It's beautiful, it would be good, it's helpful, it's beneficial. It's beneficial knowledge, but it's not farmed. It's considered a sunnah science. So those are the first things. I want to make sure I don't miss your questions. Alhamdulillah. No other questions? Bismillah. Let's make dua. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin wa salatu wa salam sayyidina abibina mulana muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Ya Allah, we ask that you make our hearts firm upon sarat al-mustaqeen. Forgive us, Ya Rabbi, for our weaknesses, our mistakes, our shortcomings. Allah, please expand our hearts. Increase us in knowledge and wisdom and understanding. Allah, we ask that you please take care of us. Be gentle with us, Ya Allah. Pour your love upon us, O Allah. Bless us to feel your love in our life, Ya Al Wadud. Bless us, Ya Rabbi, to feel your mercy and presence in our life, Ya Ar Rahman, Ya Rahim, Ya Latif. Allah, we ask for your generosity. Take care of us, Ya Rabbi. Protect us from those who wish to harm us, from those, those who are enemies. Ya Allah, heal our broken hearts. Ya Rabbi, please grant us clarity where we are confused. Ya Rabbi, bless us to stand upright where we have become weak. Allah, we ask that you make us amongst those that are upright, make us amongst those that are beneficial to others. Ya Rabbi, we ask that you bless our hearts to cry out to you, Ya Rabbi. Ya Allah, we ask that you make us amongst those that are guided aright. Make clear for us, Ya Rabbi, matters where we misunderstand or that we lack knowledge. Increase us in knowledge and wisdom, O oh Allah. O oh Allah, we ask that you bless the community of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Join our hearts. Ya Allah, please protect us from sickness, from disease, Ya Allah. Ya Rabbi, please, we ask that you protect us and those whom we love from, from any pain or trace of of illness, Ya Rabbi, that is harmful. Allah, you are our Lord, and this is our prayer. Please accept it from us, Ya Arham Rahmin. Wa sallallahu ala sayyidina habibina amuna al-Muhammad. Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Allahumma ameen. Afwa minkum. Insha'Allah, jazakum ala khair. See you next week, insha'Allah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.